All I can say is, wow, what an episode that was. Potentially the best episode in the season so far? I think it might be. Titled Eightfold Fence, this episode had a lot within it that progressed the story forward. From John Blackthorn immersing himself within Japanese culture, the transformation of Yoshitora Naga, war being declared, and the romance that we thought was always on the cards actually happening. This felt like the end of the beginning, and it marked that trouble was now on the horizon between the Eastern Army, which will be led by Toranaga, and the Western Army, which will be led by Ishido. So with that, let's jump into the episode and break down all that there was to take away from it. Here is Shogun Episode 4 Ending Explained. Just to let you know, this video will contain spoilers. The Perfect Frame Now this. Yeah. This here is the perfect frame that summed up the entire episode. It's the reaction to the end result of poison being spread internally and persuasion and undermining being the catalyst for the events that occurred in the closing moments. We had Yabushigi looking completely distraught over what happened, not because of what's to come for the fate of the people that he's supposed to be loyal to, but because Josen was killed, that meant that he's now most likely going to be declared an enemy of Ishido and place him on one side of a war that he wanted to dance on both sides of. Yabushigi is definitely a little finger type character and he always intended to jump onto the winning side when the right moment arrived. But his shock shows that it's probably off the cards now and he's worried about it. And then on the right side of the frame, slightly out of focus, was Omi. The person who nudged Nagakado over the edge and lent into his constant insecurity where he wasn't respected and was just seen as the spoiled son of Toranaga. Omi was smiling in the background due to the complete slaughtering that took place, knowing full well that an all-out war could begin. And what Kiku said about him potentially being the Lord getting closer, so both of their reactions to this slaughtering were completely different. It was a fantastic frame to have in the closing section because it had somebody who was willing to be a snake and somebody who just played both sides whilst showing both of their reactions. The Knocking Down of the Eightfold Fence this episode was titled The Eightfold Fence, and over the past week I was trying to theorize about what it could mean. But in this episode, it was revealed that in Japan, when people are young, they're told to build an impenetrable wall inside of themselves that they can retreat behind. This is something that I think sums up the way that we've seen Mariko throughout this show. She's been firmly planted behind that eightfold fence within her mind. She's a reserved individual that doesn't really give much away at all. However, it seems as though John Blackthorn is the person that's able to either climb over that fence that she's built up or she's knocking it down and opening it up to him. There was a section in this episode where she was going to reveal to John why it was that her name was known all over Japan and why it was that she was loyal to Lord Toranaga and how a great injustice stole everything from her. This is alluding to the act that her father committed, which landed her in the position that she's now in. This is what I feel the flashback that we saw taking place was pointing towards. Mariko's father was called Akechi-san, and he was an individual that killed Lord Gorodo, who was an extremely powerful daimyo. Due to him doing that, he was dishonored and his children were too. With Mariko saying that her family name is known around Japan, this is most likely why it's known. Because of what her father did. Because she was also dishonored, she wanted to commit seppuku, but it was denied and she was instead told that she had to marry Todo Buntaro. However, because it was something that she didn't want to do and she wanted to end things, she refused to be a submissive wife to him. This could be the reason why there wasn't much love lost between the pair and why it was that she didn't seem that happy because it was a place that she never really wanted to be. Obviously, we didn't hear this in the episode, but I feel it's definitely going to be coming and it will be getting revealed to John Blackthorn eventually. John said that she didn't need to tell him the story and compared her to the houses that get built and destroyed and then built and destroyed due to the natural disasters, saying that even though Mariko may have had something taken away from her and be dishonored, all he saw was a woman in front of him, something which she greatly appreciated. Within this episode, we also saw both Mariko and John Blackthorn being intimate with one another. Well, at least we think it was. The next morning, it was framed as being a courtesan, and the woman's face when in front of John Blackthorn was buried beneath the darkness of the room. However, it feels like it was most definitely her. There's a lot of tension that's been building between the both of them, and this was a moment that finally allowed Mariko to symbolically knock down that eightfold fence and be with the person that's been making her happy. John Blackthorn's Confliction one thing that I thought was pretty interesting in the episode was that John Blackthorn started it by feeling like he was a prisoner but just being in good living conditions, which it did feel like was the case. 
But as time went on, we saw him embracing the Japanese culture and learning to appreciate it for what it was. This is something that actually happened with the real-life William Adams who John Blackthorn is based on. It started with Blackthorn wanting to go back to his ship and get his weapons but not being allowed to, and him also walking on moss which is considered disrespectful. But it ended with him holding two swords which represent the samurai, calling the weather beautiful, the landscape beautiful, eating natto which is a traditional Japanese dish made from soybeans which have been fermented, and also making an effort with the language. He also gifted Fujisam one of his weapons, showing that he was grateful for her to be with him, showing that although he may have felt like a prisoner at the start, he was starting to embrace the country, the culture, and appreciate the differences whilst trying to bridge the gap. Some of the best and most humorous moments came from when Blackthorn saw Omi again. Omi was obviously the person that dragged him out through the village in the first episode and treated him horrifically, so the no love lost attitude between them was understandable and provided some hilarious moments. The Declaration of War During the beginning of the episode, we saw that Toronaga went to Izu on the ship and Yabashigi had his army swear their loyalty to Toronaga-sama. Seeing Toronaga act this way was just simply epic. Up until this point, we'd seen Toronaga being a reserved individual, but that was because he was essentially a prisoner at Osaka Castle. But in this moment, we saw the formidable, feared warrior and leader that he was. The real-life Tokugawa Ieyasu, who Toronaga is based on, is exactly that, and I feel the speech that he delivered was such a powerful moment and showed the true side of the character. With him departing to Edo and saying that he'd return once the regiment was trained, this was where we saw what happened where there was no clear leader and guiding eye to rule. Poison was getting spread amongst all parties. Yabushigi didn't know what to do due to the situation that he found himself in, and the moment that Toronaga left, he wanted to turn against him because he felt as though he was going to be on the losing side. As well as that, Kiku didn't want Yabashigi as the leader of Izu, and would rather it be Omi. And Omi was persuading Nagakado to attack Jozen, a representative of the enemy, to assert his power and show everybody that he wasn't to be seen as a joke. Whereas if Toronaga was there, then none of that would have happened. Yabashigi was being seen as a traitor in the eyes of Ashido for facilitating the escape with Toronaga, and he was being summoned back to Osaka where he'd most likely need to carry out seppuku. But he persuaded Josen to witness a display of the tactics that Blackthorn had been instilling in the men in preparation for a battle with the Western Army. This was something that Nagakado didn't want to occur because it pretty much meant that Ishido would be aware of everything that was going on and be able to prepare a way of countering it. So after being nudged by Omi, Nagakado set up a plan to hit Josen and his men when they didn't expect it. This was an utterly brutal moment and it was a blood, gore and death fest as all of his men were hit. However, with Josen still alive, he said that the way that he was attacked was not the way that samurai fought and called them all savages. This is most likely because they facilitated John Blackthorn and were learning his ways of fighting. Then, Josen was killed. The last line that we heard in the episode was Mariko saying, it is war. The first true act of war has been committed in the way of an offense and Ishido is most definitely going to retaliate. The diplomatic approach was first taken with Toronaga resigning from the council, and now with it being viewed as Toronaga's men committing a slaughtering, Ishido will be forced to show no signs of weakness, and I imagine that other regions will be on side with that. Ishido will be the person who will lead the Western army throughout all of this though. As I mentioned at the start, this not only marked the first true act of war, but it also marked the end of the beginning and the fact that the state of the nation is going to be turned onto its knees as two sides fight to seek control. The sound of the cannons being a disturbance was only a stone's drop in the river when compared to the tsunami that's going to be hitting in the form of an all-out war. So it felt like a deliberate way to show how inconsequential noise was causing a disruption, but now it's all going to matter. Toronaga is most likely going to be aggravated by his son's actions too. He knew that war was on the horizon, but he wanted to be prepared for when that moment occurred and with his son launching them into war immediately, he may feel as though the army aren't ready. So it's definitely going to be interesting to see how he responds to that. My review of the episode. I thought episode 4 was actually the best episode of the season so far. The entire time that we were watching the episode, it really did feel like there was going to be something big that was going to arrive at the end, and it definitely didn't fail to deliver. I think this was John Blackthorne's best episode. I feel the performance didn't feel as scripted or stale in its approach and there was humor, sincerity and emotion that felt like it was loaded behind it. I also thought that it was interesting learning more about Mariko. 
She's such an interesting character and we've only got a glimpse through the Eightfold Fence so far. She holds the knowledge and is the bridge between the two cultures and you see exactly how that impacts her in a positive way. This is genuinely one of the best shows on TV right now. There's not been a show like this for a while and every week I look forward to it being aired. I think the real part of the show has just begun, which means that we're most likely going to be seeing more backstabbing, more death and more battles. It's also going to be interesting seeing how John Blackthorn contributes to this too. With a week to wait, I can't wait for it to arrive. Bring it on. So, there you have it, Shogun Episode 4 Ending Explained. If you want to see more videos on Shogun, then click on the card in the top corner. I've got a playlist which contains episode breakdowns and also videos discussing the history behind the real people that the characters are based on. I'm going to be delving into Mariko and Yabashiki next, so be sure to keep your eye out for it. Thanks for tuning into the video and I'll see you in the next one.